Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes, and this is the Chapter 2 Securing Network Devices Lecture for the Clark College in Tech 225 Cisco CCNA Security Course. Today we're going to look at securing device access, assigning administrative roles, monitoring and managing devices, using automated security features, controlling the control plane. Let's talk about securing device access. So when we're done with this section, you should be able to explain how to secure a network perimeter. Configure secure administrative access to Cisco routers. Configure enhanced security for virtual logins. And configure an SSH daemon. That would be just be a uh, process like activate SSH for secure remote management. Securing the edge router. Okay, if you have a single router, you might have a different approach than if you had multiple routers. Or if you had a DMZ. DMZ is a demilitarized zone. Think of it as a kind of gray area between the unsafe internet and the uh, relatively safe LAN. So the DMZ is an area that is easier to access from the internet than the LAN is. What you would place in a DMZ would be devices like a web server. We have to think about physical security. If a hacker gains physical access to your device, the game is over. So you need to keep your devices in a locked room or cabinet and uh, hopefully have some active monitoring and logging of, uh, you know, like key card access, locked doors, that sort of thing, maybe video surveillance. A lot of that was covered in our prior lecture for chapter one. You also have to have some type of router operating system and configuration file security. And then router hardening, which we alluded to again in the last lecture with things like the Cisco auto secure command that will uh, turn off unused protocols and shut down ports and so forth. So these are some of the things that you would need to do as a to-do list to make sure you had secured administrative access. So on the left, what they call local access, we sometimes call out-of-band management. Using the console port and the special rollover cable with special terminal emulation software on a device to access our device. I call it being tethered. <laughs> you can't be that far away from the device. Uh, you're generally in the same room a few feet away. Remote access, of course, we don't want to use Telnet. We would want to use something like SSH or HTTPS. But their illustration here is oddly with Telnet. You can also gain remote access through a port we haven't looked at before called the aux port. Routers have an auxiliary port, which is designed to connect to a modem. This is not for dial-up internet. This is a modem you dial into from a hotel room, your home, wherever you can access the public switch telephone network, and you can just dial the number and connect to your remote device. When we talk about a dedicated management network, we talk about a network which is not part of the regular LAN, as in the illustration here. All of your management nodes, the devices that are used to log in to the routers and switches, are kept physically separated in a different cabling or a different VLAN than the um, production data network. Strong passwords. Very important to have a good password. Your password, if you turn on the password encryption service, will turn your passwords into an MD7 hash. That's in fact what that little seven means after the word password in the example in the lower part of the slide. What it's showing is you can literally type or cut and paste a MD7 hash into Google or any number of MD7 crackers, and they will be able to crack it and tell you what that password is. So MD7 is not considered secure today. So MD7 passwords are dangerous. 
Fortunately, your router enable secret password is still MD5, which is more secure. The lower the number, the more secure. So here you can see that you can configure all secret passwords using type 8 or type 9 passwords by uh, modifying the algorithm that is used for the enable secret. The default is MD5, but you could use SHA-256 um, or, or others. You can also encrypt the username. Securing line access. This is an example of creating a username Bob and a secret password Cisco 45321. And we're going to use scrypt to encrypt that password. And it's a hash algorithm, so it's going to be hash encrypted. And then we're going to go ahead and set up our remote um, access to be SSH. Okay, there's a a few things um, missing here from this that would prevent SSH from working. You have to uh, have to do a few things that that aren't here, but um, that's okay. Configuring enhanced security for vital logins, virtual logins. Apologies. Your virtual login security enhancements. You put a banner message. You learn this in CCNA classes. A banner message is a legal obligation, like a keep out sign, that warns uh, would be log in folks um, what the consequences of, of breaking into your system are. Okay, this is how you might set some of those enhanced login features. A login delay, for instance, will delay if you log if you are unsuccessful at logging in. It won't allow that username to attempt another login for a certain number of seconds. So slowing down the login attempts uh, prevents a lot of like brute force attacks where they try to log in again and again and again and again and again, and they just have a robotic computer doing it. If you incur a long delay, like say 240 seconds or 500 seconds, uh, it's going to really uh, really help limit that. And also log on failure, logging all the failures, very important so that you can see if you're being hacked. And this is how the command could uh, manifest itself. You have a login block for 120 seconds, that'd be two minutes, and you're going to allow five attempts. So every five attempts, it'll give a 120 second timeout. Okay, log in quiet mode. And you've got labs where you get to explore this. And your online interactive curriculum will also let you experience some of these. Like I said, logging the failed attempts is really important so that you can actively manage the logs and see who is unsuccessful at logging in. And if the same username is showing up over and over, as here we see admin, 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 you're going to start thinking someone's up to something. Figuring SSH. Now we get to really do it. All right, so you have to set an IP domain name. That's one of the things that was missing in the example a few slides ago. So you have to set an IP domain name. This can just be a made up name, yourname.com, whatever.com. And then you have to create a crypto key, an RSA crypto key, and set a modulus. So modulus 1024 is the lowest uh, modulus, which is currently considered secure today. And so I, I would go ahead and go with uh, that modulus. If you go much lower than, I think if you go lower than 768, you can't uh, use SSH version two. You'd be restricted to the less secure SSH version one. So things to keep in mind. Modifying the SSH configuration. So if you wanna go ahead and add a timeout or add how many retries they get before it kicks them off, you can set those variables.
You can connect to SSH using uh, a number of third-party applications on Windows. If you use a Mac or Linux, SSH is at the command line already. Uh, Windows 10 is working on adding it to PowerShell, but uh, currently, um, and you can add it uh, manually. Currently, it is not included with Windows 10 as of the anniversary update. Uh, it is available as a manual um, add-in that you can you can put in there, and I've experimented with that. It works quite well. Or just install Putty, and that works excellent, and it's GUI-based. A win-win. Section 2.2, Assigning Administrative Roles. So when we're done with this section, you should be able to configure administrative privilege levels to control command availability and configure role-based CLI access to control command availability. Essentially, instead of a one-size-fits-all, anyone who logs in gets full run of the router, we can go ahead and restrict some user accounts so that they can only use certain commands. There are some predefined levels. So these are called privilege levels and you have levels 0 through 15. By default, only 0 and 15, sorry, 1 and 15 um, are, um, are defined. So enable mode would be 15 and uh, the default for login with a router prompt is 1. So you're either at level 1 if you log in or and so one would be user exec and 15 would be privilege exec. You can see that there. But you can custom define all the other all the other levels. So we can use the command privilege and then mode to set a custom level like level two or five or seven. And then we can go ahead and assign specific commands to that level and assign users to that level. This is an example of how that might look. So we make a, uh, a little bang here. This is a comment. This won't be stored. This comment level five and support user configuration never is uh, stored anywhere in the router. Any command and line starting with a bang is ignored. But it's a nice way to put comments in your notepad config. So if you're saving your configs to notepad, it's very helpful to add comments like this. But you notice we're making a couple users and then we're assigning them to custom levels. We've made a level five and a level 10. Remember that level 15 already exists, so that's why the configuration is a little um, more brief, one, one line briefer there for level 15 because we're just assigning a user to that level. So some limitations of privilege levels. Let's talk about role-based command line interface. So we're going to talk about something called AAA, accounting authorization. And in that, we can basically use a remote, like a Windows server, to provide our remote um, authorization. So we could have a single sign-on. That would be much better than having locally stored usernames and passwords in the routers and switches to have them centrally located on a, um, on a database server. Okay, so in role-based, we're able to create views, and the views have commands assigned to them. And super views are just like groups. So you can take views that you build and group them together into a super view. So you might have a super view called admins, and then you might have some views within that for different types of admins. You might have a backup admin and a super admin and you get the idea. So you would type enable view and then give the view a name like um, you know backup admin. And then you assign commands to the view. Okay, so here's a example of junior admin. And you type enable the view and log in and you see the commands that are available to you there. Monitoring and managing devices. 
Upon completion of this section, you should be able to use the Cisco IOS resilient configuration feature to secure the Cisco IOS image and configuration files. Compare in-band and out-of-band management access, configure syslog to log system events, and configure secure SNMP v3 access using ACLs. Also configure network time protocol to enable accurate time stamping between all devices. Very important to have accurate time. So what this means with a resilient configuration feature is someone can't accidentally uh, erase it. You know in the lab how you erase your config and reset the router to factory defaults? Well, if you had a resilient configuration feature um, turned on, you wouldn't be able to do that. Your configuration would keep coming back. So here's some uh, facts about how to use it and the limitations. So secure boot image is for the iOS image. So no one accidentally deletes your iOS image. It prevents the deletion or change of the iOS image. Also secure boot config would uh, do the same thing to your configuration. So this would be configuring secure copy. This is recovering your router password. Now I'm not going to go through all these steps. I'm kind of um, skipping through these slides. There's some 90 slides, and I don't want to read you all these steps. They're in your they're in your ebook, and many of these are in your lab. You have a lab where you do a uh, password recovery on a router, but these would be the steps. So these are just here for you to look at. If you type no service password recovery, that is going to prevent password recovery from working. Please be careful when you do that in the lab to make sure you type service password recovery to turn that back on. We don't want to have a hassle not being able to recover the passwords in the lab. And don't tell other students these commands. Keep them within the um, CCNA security course. Secure management and reporting. Determining the type of management access. Okay, we talked a little about in-band and out-of-band. So in-band management is probably the most secure. You've got to, uh, you've got to use a tethered cable for in-band, sorry, out-of-band, my apologies. Out-of-band management is the most secure because you have to use a special cable. You have to have physical proximity to the device. So you're basically tethered to the device. You have to be able to get to it and plug into it on the console port. The in-band is the, the one where someone can be anywhere in the world. And so for in-band management, we want to apply ACLs and really restrict the source networks that are allowed to connect. And we also want to reduce the protocols to only secure protocols like IPsec, SSH, SSL and decide if you need to open all the time. You can create a timed ACL so that remote access is only available on certain days and times. Using syslog. Syslog is just a little app you can run in Windows or Linux and it uh, logs all of the event messages, the error messages and all of those kind of messages that are popping up on your console terminal screens in lab those can all be sent to a syslog server to be stored on a big hard drive, and then they can be sorted and uh, grouped and filed away. And boy, those are wonderful for forensics when you're trying to figure out what a hacker did. Hopefully, you're looking at those logs actively and can see what a hacker is trying to do and then stop them before they're successful. Usually, hacking takes a while. There's a lot of failed attempts, and those failed attempts would show in the log records but you need to log them to be able to um, discover them. We have syslog installed on all the PCs in our lab. So if you're in our lab, we also have it installed on the PCs in the net lab. So if you're remotely connecting to our lab from home, you'll be able to uh, pull up the um, syslog 
and we use something called Kiwi Syslog, which is a free one that's not very good, but it's free. <laughs> and you could actually log directly to the uh, Microsoft uh, Windows Server a logging protocol. So you might even be able to do it with a Windows 10 machine. I know you can do it with a 2012 server. You can just um, send them to the Windows logging service. And if you have a Mac or Linux, you can send them to the um, operating system logging service as well. But I like to kind of use a separate program to keep these logs uh, separated out. This is the seven levels or eight levels, I guess, of the syslog messages, and you get to set the logging level that you want. Do you want to get debugging messages? Do you want to get um, only critical messages? Do you want to get messages about all the errors and the warnings? So as you um, kind of go down the list, you're going to get um, you're going to get more and more traffic. This is where, if you're going to do logging, you really have to have accurate time and date stamps. Logs aren't very useful if the time is wrong or the date's back in the 1990s, so you want to make sure the clock is set. An easy way to do that is use NTP, Network Time Protocol, that we'll be getting to shortly. So you can see you can have a lot of syslog clients, and then you can have your syslog server sitting somewhere on your network. In this case, the syslog server is in the DMZ. That's a really, really bad idea. Your syslog server should be in the protected LAN, but this is just an example. Uh, the DMZ is, is uh, theoretically less secure, easier to access from the outside world, so you would want your logs to be as protected as possible. Oftentimes, I'll put the logging in a VLAN where there's only um, one directional access. But here's how you turn it on. You just tell it where to send it. You say logging, host, and then provide the IP address to send the logs off to, and then logging trap, and you pick the logging level, one, two, three, seven, whatever you want. And you can even specify a source interface for the logs to originate from. The reason for this is, is really for security and sorting. It means they will use the IP address of that interface when it sends every log message. So usually we do this from like a loopback. I'll create a loopback interface. And again, I can then lock down my logging server to only accept logs from certain IP addresses because otherwise the router would be sending from various IPs depending on routing. Uh, but if you use the logging source interface command, it restricts all log messages to originate from uh, whatever source interface you specify. And of course, turn on logging. It's on by default. Using SNMP, which is Simple Network Management Protocol for Network Security. So SNMP is a way that we can monitor managed devices. So you have uh, what's called nodes and what's called a manager. So there's an SNMP manager and there's an SNMP um, node. And so these are all managed nodes or agents. Okay. And this is called the MIB or management information base. And the MIB is the database where all the information that is um, obtained through SNMP is logged. Now, SNMP is pretty cool because you actually can send two directionally. So you can send instructions to a managed device, um, usually called a trap. So you can ask it to trap certain information or change its parameters from the um, management console. And of course, the agents are always sending in the data whenever the trap is met. So you set a condition on an interface. You say, okay, if this interface exceeds 50% bandwidth utilization, I want you to send me a message. And so that would be an example of the type of trap that you might set on an agent. It's very complicated to get into SNMP. This is just a, a brief overview in this chapter. These are the various versions and what's happened as we go through different versions. 
You can see with version three, they finally introduced data encryption, AES. So you can actually encrypt the messages, which is really helpful, uh, especially if you have to send the messages across um, any kind of uh, less secure networks. SNMP has certain vulnerabilities. Uh, mainly, they're the older versions, so you want to avoid using versions one and two. As you can see, version three improves things by having an encrypted tunnel, making it much harder for a hacker to gain access to your managed nodes or get the data they're sending back. And this is how you set up that security in SNMP v3. Security is optional, so you have to turn it on after you've enabled SNMP v3. So you set up your um, access list and then apply it to the SNMP server group. SNMP, I should mention, is used by many companies besides Cisco. It is key to Microsoft Server Client Management. So that is the protocol that Microsoft servers use um, to manage remote clients. So Microsoft Windows operating systems, they're managed by a Microsoft Windows server. The server uses SNMP. It is a manager and the clients are agents and the manager can find out what apps are installed, for instance. So the server can ask a client, hey, what application software do you have installed? Or alert me when, um, alert me when some criteria is met, right, some condition. Let's talk about NTP, Network Time Protocol. If you're not using NTP, you really should. It's so easy to set up, it's so useful. I think when we're doing labs, we just don't think about the clock. In a production environment, setting the clock is probably the very first thing I would want to do after putting the host name on, honestly. Uh, uh, you have to have an active IP address and some other things for it to work. You have to be able to get out to an NTP server. You can actually make a switcher router an NTP server as well. So you could choose a device on your own network and set it up as an NTP server to provide clocking to the other devices. After all, it's not so important that the clock is, is spot on accurate to the nanosecond. What's important is all devices have the same clocking. So first thing you'd want to do if you want to set up an NTP server is the server needs to have the right time and date. So first you'd use the clock set command to get that set up. It's also helpful, even if you're going to have an NTP client, it's helpful to set the clock. If the clock is far off from the real time, NTP will take a long time to correct it. You can read up on the protocol, but basically if your clock is way out of whack by several years, it, it may take like hours for NTP to bring that clocking up to the correct uh, time and date. So you can speed things up even on an NTP client by uh, by setting the clock as manually as well, as close to within a few minutes or so of the real time. So here we're setting an NTP master. We're telling router one, you'll be the clock. Okay, and then we're telling router two that router one is the clock. So see how, it easy, how easy it is, it's a single command. NTP master one. And then router one goes, okay, cool, I'm a master one. By the way, there's different levels of master. So a master one, which you would never do, you would want to be like a master 10 or something, um, but that's fine in this example. So the lower the number, the more reliable the clock. And it's uh, generally, and that helps router two if it's got several NTP servers set. So you can actually type the NTP server command several times and add multiple NTP servers, and it will communicate with all of them and get clocking from all of them, but it will choose the one with the with the lower master numbers. So a, a master five would be more accurate than a master 10. Um, generally, I don't like to set anything below a master 10. So I choose 10 or 12 or even 15. You can set up authentication on your NTP server as well to require clients to provide a trusted key. That way you're not giving clocking out to just anybody. I mean, wouldn't a hacker like to know what time and date you're logging? Um, this would prevent that. Using automated security. 
So we talked a little about this um, in our last lecture in chapter one, auto secure and some security audit tools for vulnerabilities. So performing a security audit. You've got your, you got your router all configured. That would be step one. It's all operational, interfaces are up, uh, you know, IPs, routing tables, all that. And now you want to um, perform a security audit. First thing you're gonna wanna do is take a look at CDP neighbors. Here's the thing though. CDP neighbors really is insecure, so you're probably gonna have this disabled, so probably you're not gonna see anything here. Here they don't have it disabled, so the neighbor devices are sending CDP updates. So if I can type show CDP neighbors detail and I can see these details, I'm gonna to wanna to go to those devices and type CDP disable. And that's gonna turn off CDP, or you can type no CDP run. and LLDP as well. I want to disable those. Those are services that give you information about other devices. And that's bad because hackers like to get information about other devices and there's no way to secure or encrypt CDP. So it's a best practice to just disable Cisco CDP's uh, Cisco Discovery Protocol service. And of course, there's detailed information of the security settings for the various protocols in the text. Additional recommended practices is to turn off unnecessary services and interfaces. So make sure interfaces you're not using are in a shutdown status. This especially applies to switches where all your interfaces are up, up in the beginning. It's important to use like a range command and shut those down. And some of the other things that you may want to do there. Locking down a router using auto secure, really helpful. All you have to do is type auto secure and it goes through and does it for you. It'll test, as I say, 10 different things and uh, it'll go through and give you a, a little report there. And you can see you have some optional parameters you can give auto secure. You can just run auto secure. Um, you may want to run auto secure no interact if you don't want to get prompted with questions. Otherwise it's going to ask you some questions like a wizard. It's going to have kind of like a, a setup wizard to ask you a few questions as it goes. Okay, so there's your different options. That's the process it goes through. Securing the control plane. So if you recall from our chapter one, we took a look at the data plane, the control plane, and the management plane and talked about the compartmentalization of your network into those three planes on each device. So this would be talking about the routing protocol. That's what lives in the control plane is routing protocol. So we've set up routing protocols in our previous classes. Now what we're going to try to do is add encryption to those. We're going to encrypt the routing protocol updates that are sent to the neighbor routers. We're going to learn how to redirect some traffic. That's what hackers would want to do, redirect traffic to create a loop, redirect traffic so they can see it easier in an insecure part of the network, and redirect traffic so you throw it away and it doesn't reach its intended destination. All of those can be um, accomplished by giving your router a bad routing table update. Again, this is a, um, there's one pane missing, the management pane, that would be kind of over here. And the management panes, remember, a uh, job for remote connectivity uh, for management, as well as out-of-band uh, local connectivity. So your console port and your SSH and those kind of things are over there. In the data plane, it's packets flowing in and out of the device. 
Then up at the control plane, you have the route process. Okay, like, like we talked about, you may want to have a um, ACL on your ingress interface that uh, filters who can access the management plane and who can access the control plane. Uh, an ACL, for instance, could restrict routing table updates uh, from only certain IPs. If you know the IP address of the neighbor router, you could throw that into the access control list and they wouldn't even be able to uh, send the, uh, even if they could match the encryption, they couldn't get it there because they'd have to spoof the IP address. You're just upping the game, right? So an interface ACL would be one way to uh, enhance the security of your control and management planes. can also run something called COP, and uh, that can be helpful as well. Okay, summary. We looked at configure secure administrative access. We looked at configure command authorization using privilege levels and also role-based. Those were the views. And we implemented the secure management and monitoring of network uh, devices, looking at things like encrypted uh, routing table updates. We used automated features to enable security on iOS-based routers. Um, we used the Cisco Auto Secure command for that. And implementing control plane security, like having an ACL on the ingress interface that filters uh, what, what devices can send routing table updates and so forth. See you next week for the Chapter 3 lecture.